the type of pictures that Joel is giving us, these fantastic, authentic pictures. Look at this guy, he's looking at his picture of himself with his trophy. Look at the happiness on his face, right? This is perfect. This is great, which leads to the next, I'm gonna go forward one. Oh, that one really didn't go well. Uh, that should say speed trumps perfection. The next learning that we've had, speed trumps perfection. Um, and I think this is hard for us as marketers. Again, as I say, like a long-term company, 127 years old. We're rock polishers, let's face it. We work as hard on the last 5% as we did on the first 95%. We're perfectionists. That's what marketers are, that's what we were trained to be. And now, moving in real time requires us to let go of some of that perfectionism, right? When Oreo did the dunk in the dark, I thought to myself, I'm not sure we could have done that, in all honesty. The, the process is, was not at the time, it is now, in place at our company to do that. But the point is, dunking in the dark the next day doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really matter how good your content is if you miss the contextual relevance. It doesn't make sense. You have to hit the contextual relevance with your great content. So speed trumps perfection. At Facebook, they say done is better than perfect, right? Any of these maxims work for the, pro the, the imperative now. So this is another picture that Joel took. Again, he's off around the world taking these beautiful, authentic, lovely pictures for us. And we take them and we add content to them and then we send them out in real time. So wherever we are, we're, we're sending out content from wherever we are in the world. So these are real fan stories from a photographer that go to our creative team that then go back out to 175 markets. And that's the definition of speed trumping perfection. We're moving in real time now. I'm gonna go forward. We've opened a hub network um, at Coca-Cola, so we have a real-time listening and engagement, engagement center. We have eight full-time analysts. We have eight hipsters on campus at Coca-Cola. Um, and they're engaging in the conversation. They're teaching the other 2,700 marketers at Coke how to operate in real time. These are the capabilities that you have to get after, right? There are up to 15,000 tweets every day just on brand Coca-Cola. We have to be part of that conversation. So the hub helps us monitor this conversation on FIFA. We're putting out our own content. They're fueling our own content further. They're picking up the content and the conversation that's out there and fueling that further. All the people who have their pictures of the cup. This is our real-time FIFA newsroom that we're operating. Go forward. So this leads to operating principles that look very different in a real-time world, as I mentioned. Uh, the, the, perhaps the biggest thing that I would say is under pressure is a hierarchy. Any of these brand big companies that are built on hierarchy, I say that hierarchy is very much under pressure now. We have these eight millennials in the hub who have the keys to the castle. They're communicating in real time in the marketplace on our brands. That's, I mean, that's a very different paradigm for a company the size of Coca-Cola. Right, so empowerment is tr trumping hierarchy now. Obviously technology is empowering all of that. We know the content of the conversation. We can be predictive now. We know what happens when we put content out. We know who's tweeting about us and who's not. We know who those people are connected to and if it matters if they tweet or not. Right, the, the, the technology underlays everything that we're doing. The measurement is real time, as I said. When we do something wrong, our disconnects go up 4x. We know immediately when we've done something wrong and we can correct it, and by the way, the measurement informs the next decision. So every decision we take has an outcome that comes back to the front of the next decision and informs that next decision. And of course the capabilities, as I mentioned, not a small job to have 2,700 marketers who are ready for this world. The next piece I would say, the next learning I would say, is this notion of being ambitious. And it's something we talk about a lot in my team, and Paul mentioned it a little bit, and set up. I think, you know, we get, I get asked, well, you know, what keeps you up at night? I, I do stay awake at night thinking we're not ambitious enough. Perhaps we're not brave enough. Perhaps we're not innovative enough. Perhaps we're not pursuing an agenda that is responsible enough for this incredible gift of a brand that we have. And my point would be, if we, all of us, are not ambitious for our brands, who will be? Who will be ambitious if we are not the ones who are ambitious for our brands? We must be. If we want to define the next agenda of marketing, we must be the ones who are brave enough 
to go forward with an ambitious, ambitious agenda. We just, as I said, launched our FIFA World Cup campaign. Wyden and Kennedy did a fantastic job. The idea is so simple. If football if, is the, the world's favorite sport, and it is, and if Brazil is the birthplace of Brazil and arguably the world's country, one of the most welcoming and warm countries, and if Coca-Cola is the most ubiquitous brand and arguably everybody's drink, then is it the World Cup or is it the world's cup? Is it everybody's cup? And that simple apostrophe S of the World's Cup is now our ambition. We will make this World Cup the World's Cup to seven billion people. That is outrageously ambitious. And I love it, right? We will die trying, getting seven billion people to know about what we're doing and the fact that this is in fact their cup. This is their sport. This is their opportunity, right? That's the type of ambition that we all have to have. And in order to have that level of ambition, we have to be very willing to pursue an innovation agenda that means we will fail. If we are not failing enough, we are not innovating enough. It is that simple. You simply aren't on the edge if you're not failing. You're still some measure of distance back from how innovative you can be. So we all have to largely reframe failure at our companies. Failure is not a bad thing. Failure is bad if you don't learn from it and if you repeat the same failure. That's bad. Right? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to get better at talking about and sharing our learnings so that we don't leave some measure of innovation on the table. The final thing I would say is this idea of work that matters. And I think it is deeply, deeply important, back to the opening point I made on creating value. Our responsibility is to create work that matters. And and work that matters means that it matters to our business, certainly, and can create value for us, but that it matters far beyond our business, that, that we can use our position, our platform, to create an impact in the world that is good for us, certainly, unapologetically a capitalist. We're in business, we're a for-profit business, but we can use that to create a goodness in the world that transcends just our goodness. It's really the definition of doing well by doing good. That maxim could never be more true than now. I'm going to show you a piece of film that I truly think measures up to work that matters. The relationship between India and Pakistan is one that has seen a lot of lows. It's stressful, it's tense. It seems it's not improving and it's getting worse. It's only been 60 years that we have been apart. Before that, we were living harmoniously together. I think all the strife would go away if you took away the Baghdad in the middle of the two countries. It saddens me that we have this neighbor that we can't even go visit. They have this perception which they've been ingrained in the head that that's the bad guy. But when they actually meet them, they realize, you know what, you're just like me. Mainly because there's no communication. They're near us, but we have no access to them. And it's sad, because together I think we would do wonders. So creating an environment where young people can exchange ideas, thoughts, gestures, and take away that communication gap that exists. If I have any opportunity to go to India, I'll surely go there.
the whole idea of actually touching hands, it's like communicating with each other without words. And that action speaks louder than anything else. It's like, this is what we're supposed to do, right? We are going to take minor steps so that we are going to solve bigger issues. It is more about, you know, how similar we are as opposed to how different we are. Togetherness, humanity, this is what we want. More and more exchange. So I don't think there's a better example of work that matters than that. When your work can certainly create a goodness uh, for your brand and company, but also create a goodness in the world that transcends just your company. Ultimately, we fundamentally believe that we can create growth and goodness at the same time. Those two cannot pull apart, just as liquid and link won't pull apart, right? Create growth for ourselves and in so doing, we create a goodness that transcends our own growth in the world. And that is our chief responsibility. We feel it and we live it and we own it. So that's a quick canter through Liquid and Linked. Um, it's about stories, brand stories, content, conversations, experiences coming together through the combination of owned, earned, shared, and paid media with social at the heart to create a value, certainly a value for ourselves, but a value that also transcends our company. Talk today about five learnings. If you do nothing else, be shareworthy. Right? It's the most important thing you can do in a socially connected world. Embrace your new sales force. They are the carriers of your message. They want to carry the message of your companies and of your brands. Speed trumps perfection. You gotta, you've gotta move in real time in this world. If you miss the context, it doesn't matter how good the content is if it's out of context. Be ambitious for your brands. If you are not, no one else will be. And ultimately, create work that matters. Work that can create goodness, certainly for your brands and companies, but work that also can create a goodness in the world. Thank you very much. Few, um, few minutes for questions, if there are any. But I also like stunned silence. Yes, in the back. Hi, Wendy. Hi. Intimacy and scale, so interesting. Um, we would call it, so in Coke language, we call it local relevance and global, global scale, right? Global reach. Um, I'll correct you a little bit. The views on that are about two and a half million views or so uh, on the uh, small world machines. We believe that great stories actually transcend local boundaries. So actually that was largely viewed in the Western world. It was also picked up obviously in India and Pakistan. Um, but the Western world saw that too and it moved. Um, I think we, it's a tender balance that we always try to strike. Uh, I can tell you we know when we get it wrong, um, so that when we overscale something and it doesn't have that local relevance, um, it doesn't work. If we get too local, the brands feel too small, uh, they don't feel big enough, and this, there's a majesty that comes with Coca-Cola and, and, and such a big brand. Um, the one thing I would say is we do a pretty good job uh, on some of our things of of doing versioning and tra what I call transcreation. So for instance, we just launched uh, an anthem with our FIFA World Cup effort, which you probably know, I mean, we generally do the anthems because they provide a consistent thread between our work. So the Canaan waving flag from 2010, we've done this World Cup's version we just launched. The markets will take that anthem and bring a local singer in to actually co-create with David Corey as the singer, but they'll do a, duet, same song, but we'll do cut-ins in Portuguese or cut-ins in Mandarin or so that it feels so that there's some local relevance to it. And that's generally where we find the right 
place for the brand. This is right somewhere in the combination. What you can't let do, and I mean, I think the watch out in doing that is that you go to a lowest common denominator because then the work's not good. So you've got to keep your ambition for the work pretty high, but, but think about ways that you can make it authentically, locally right, but also scalable. So it's tricky. It's, it's tricky, but I think we, you kind of know it when you see it, and you kind of know where you can move in and around it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Yes, yes, Open Happiness we launched um, probably about four and a half years ago now. It is in 100% of our markets, which is not a small undertaking. So it takes us years to get to that sort of amplification. So, and of course, you all know clients well enough. The minute we get to that, we're like, well, we're bored with that. Now what are we gonna do, right? So we're trying to not be bored. Um, and we're trying to realize that we think there's a lot, a lot of room in open happiness. There's a lot of legs to go. It's right on, it's right smack dab on our brand positioning. And, um, you know, and it's, it's got an action to it. I mean, the m most brands love that notion of, you know, we also want you to open and drink. So, I mean, it, it, it's easy, it's simple. It's a really great construct that has worked very, very well. Of course, you know, we've done Olympics now in it, we've done FIFA in it, we've done, you know, digital, all, amplified just about every which way, and it, and it can carry all of that. So, yes, we're staying there. Yes? Yes, yes, that's a good question. So the question is really about sort of engagement of millennials within Coca-Cola. The two things that we do right now, uh, number one, we run a community space panel uh, globally. So we have 800 teams in eight countries uh, doing, so we can do real-time paneling, uh, which I think is important. And the fascinating thing about the community space panel is, again, this is just second nature to this audience. When we found when we weren't using them, so if we weren't putting content out and having, you know, engaging them, they started engaging with one another and just co-creating, like, oh, hey, you're in Istanbul, I'm in Hong Kong, that's cool, what do you, you know, and they just take off and start doing stuff. They're doing projects together just because they're connected. It's fascinating, right? I mean, fascinating. The other thing we're doing is we work with the World Economic Forum and we work, we're one of three um, uh, global sponsors with the Global Shapers, if you've heard of the Global Shapers. These are amazing people if you've never met them all under 30 entrepreneurs who are like not kidding changing the world incredible incredible people that the world economic forum has found and we bring the global shapers into our business they come in in business plan meetings and that sort of thing so i would say from a recruitment perspective i mean i sort of jokingly said they're eight hipsters at coke but we, we do have a few more than that um and you know i think from a recruitment perspective i think if if we have an agenda that looks appealing, we've been able to recruit the right type of people. We just recruited a, a superstar out of LA to come and run gaming for us. Matt Wolf, he's terrific. Uh, he's a millennial, he's coming in. So, I mean, I would say we, we I, I'm probably being a little facetious on the fact that we don't have that. I think we have a lot of the right markers there. But we can always have more. Yeah, one more? Yeah, it's a very good question. So the question was, you know, you measure brand value. You obviously know how to do that, but how do you measure this thing called shared value? It's a bit nebulous, right? Um, we are measuring, uh, our, our discrete measurement for it is trust. Uh, we believe that if we are creating more shared value in the world, people will trust our company brand and our brands more. Um, and so we, we really are going for the reputational measures as much as anything. Um, so I think that's the, when, when you get into the quantitative, it's trust and or other, you know, a, for a brand, for someone like me and those sorts of measures where we're earning our way. 
Um, we also, you know, we're obviously keeping track of different sentiment on our brands, so we want to lower negative sentiment, um, and we think that that is a, another way to do that. And then qualitatively, I mean, you, there are a lot of qualitatives that you can look at, the, the access that the company and the brands have, um, the media impressions that you create um, through, you know, the, these other programs that you're doing, the earned pickup that the stories get is, is pretty significant, right? So I think there's some soft metrics we can look at too, but the, if it, on, on quantitative, it's trust. I think we're up. All right, thank you guys.